welcome everyone. Uh, today we'll be covering a couple of different things. The main topic of the lecture is uh, views, multiple coordinated views. But since we have a midterm coming up on Thursday, and looking at last year's and the years before his exams, uh, the main weak spot that I realized everybody had was like doing a formal design critique. And so I figured I'll spend some time on going over that stuff again. Um, and then we'll be doing one design critique uh, afterwards. So first, some announcements. Uh, there's no class next Tuesday. Uh, class is canceled because like everybody who does academic visualization is traveling to Phoenix to go to the IEEE VIS conference. Um, there will be office hours held by Trang and Pranav. Um, so if you're working on the homework, you can get support then. Uh, but Carolina and I will not be in town. Um, then, of course, you know that the midterm exam is coming up. Um, since I won't be here, this will be run by another faculty member, Jason Lisi. He's the uh, HCI faculty at the School of Computing, and the TAs will also be here to help. Um, so if you have any clarification questions on the exam, you can ask um, these guys. Um, so, uh, what do you need to do when you try to critique... Uh, yeah? Sorry, when is the um, proposal for the final project due? Uh, not next week. or like, it, There is a deadline for announcing your project team in, I think, about three weeks. Um, and then in about four weeks, I think your proposal is due. If I remember correctly, homework uh, six and the proposal are due the same date. Yeah. Any other questions about the exam? Homework, homework six is like 29th of October, proposal date is 27th of October. Okay, that's a mistake. They're supposed to be both on Friday. Uh, so I'll take a look at that. But in this, in this um, ballpark, yes. Um, Oh, and another note, I won't be sharing those slides. This is kind of a bonus for the people that are here. Um, so, these critique slides here, so if you want to take notes, go ahead. Um, so, like, what, what do we need to do when we want to critique a design, uh, like a visualization design? Um, well, first, the first thing is we need to do is we need to identify what is the data being shown and also speculate about the tasks and the intentions of the designer. Uh, for example, we want to make it a judgment whether we have uh, quantitative data that, that is being shown, whether it's a time series data, and if that is the case, we might actually, uh, the, the, the reasonable task would be to um, see the changes over time. If we have qualitative data, um, that's quite often supplementary, right? We might have, for example, quantitative data that gives us like stock, um, stocks um, uh, from like the IT sector and then uh, we have quantitative data that gives us, that shows us stocks from the uh, energy sector. And those might be color coded with those categorical labels on top of that. So qualitative labels are often on top of that. Um, another example would be if I have quantitative data and two different com conditions. So if I have that, very often uh, I want to make a comparison. So a uh, before and after, or uh, US versus Canada, or something like that. Um, and so thinking about um, like what is the data, what types of data are there exactly, there's quite often multiple types of data at the same time in the chart, um, and what is the likely intentions um, of the designer, what are the tasks that you can fulfill with them is the first step to uh, analyzing a visualization. Um, so here is an example of, like, we had this, we had seen this, this is about the kids in science, like I'm going to essentially recycle um, a lot of the figures that we've seen before, but just like, go at them uh, from a different angle. Um, so how do you feel about science? Here we have um, a before and after, so we kind of want to make a comparison. You could also say this is temporal, but the temporal aspect here isn't that important. It's more about this explicit comparisons between those two categories. So we have essentially two different categories, before and after, and then we have these five categories here. Um, and then on top of these five categories, we had the, the designer here has also like created a order not great group, a kind of interested and excited group. Um, and so he kind of lets us make these comparisons very explicitly. The thing that people struggle with the most is interestingly it is identifying marks and channels. And here it's not actually the channels, it's the marks. Uh, if you, if you, like, there will be a question on the midterm that will ask you, what are the marks used in this visualization? Um, and the answer is, 
think about what encodes the existence of an item. How, do you can, how can you tell whether something is there versus not? We don't care about the quantity or the quality of it. We just care about is it here or not. This is what the mark tells us. And the mark could be like a point, a line, or a shape. I'll have a lot of examples later and we'll be trying to come up with these uh, ourselves. The channels encode the magnitude of the dimension associated with an item. Remember, items are the rows in the table versus um, the dimensions or the variables are the columns in the table. And so if I, um, like the mark says there is a row and the channel says how much um, of it is there in this particular variable. Um, and then uh, you encode that with the magnitude of the dimension associated with an item. And then we uh, get into all of those visual variables or channels that we've talked a lot about things like position, size, saturation, and color. So you really need to be able to pick those two apart. And so here's a couple of examples. What is the mark here? Point. What is the channel? Position. Position. And what is the data? Or not only the types, don't worry about the semantics. So we have quantitative data, but we also have four different conditions, right? So there is, uh, we have a qualitative, qualitative four categories here, and here are the categories which are often encoded with color, but in this case they are encoded by position. Um, so this is essentially a faceted chart. What is the mark here? Somebody? The slice, yes. So it is the slice. Um, more generally, the term here would be shape. If you say slice, this is the correct answer, right? But uh, more generally, this is some arbitrary shape that encodes the existence of an item. What is the channel? Color. Size. So I heard color. Size. So size and angle is, is kind of correct. Uh, angle is correct. The other thing that is definitely correct here is arc length. Um, size is also correct, but it is not proportional, right? The sizes here, um, or they're proportional, but not linearly proportional. So the, the absolutely correct answer would either be angle or arc length. We know from perceptual studies that people read arc length, so that arc length would be the correct answer, the, the perfect answer for uh, a pie chart. What's the deal here with color? It's not encoding anything. Yeah, it's not encoding anything. It's just helping us to keep the neighboring uh, segments apart, but you can see that essentially social network and e-commerce are, uh, are basically undistinguishable here on this chart, or hardware and get general consumer web. So this is not a good use of color, uh, but it is, uh, like it, the, the purpose of the color here is just to keep things apart. The labels you mean? Uh, the labels are also, uh, yeah, so this would be, this is a good point. Um, you actually have another mark here, which is the text label, and the channel would be the encoding of the number. So yes, that is correct. It's not a visual channel though, right? It's, it is kind of like, it's not visualization, it's label, it's, it's just text. Um, but strictly speaking, you're right. What's the mark here? Lines. Lines, Lines exactly. And what's the channel? Position. Position, yeah. So that's an easy one. What's the mark here? Area, Area or shape? Yeah. shape? What's the channel? Color. <laughs> so there is color in here. Color is used for labeling. Position. So it's pos it's only position for one, uh, for one single of these data items. So it's only position for the yellow ones, right? Uh, because position essentially, like we need a common baseline. But for the upper ones, it is size, because they don't have a common baseline. What we judge here is not the distance from here to here and from here to here, but we judge the distance from here to here and here to here. And so this is not position, this is size. And the tricky part here is the mark is the shape or the area, and then the uh, channel is the size of the area in the y direction. Not the color. Uh, the color, yeah. 
The color is here for categories or just labeling essentially. The color labels the items. So I, I, in this case, color is kind of like again mostly to identify the items and not really a data encoding, right? We've seen this one. What are the marks? Yes, these cubes. Yes, what, is, what are the child channels? So I hear size, which is correct. So obviously, the size of these uh, cubes, or like we should probably say the size of the rectangles, um, is, is encodes the quantity. Um, I also heard color. Is color correct? Saturation. Yes. Saturation, yes. So this is important to keep apart, right? Color versus saturation. We don't ever want to be encoding any quantitative data with, with color, or more specifically, I should say hue. So you shouldn't use the word color in, these, in, this, in such a formal context. You should say hue versus saturation to, take, to, to keep this clearly separated. Um, okay, uh, so uh, this is clear, like marks and channels, how to tease those apart, what they mean. Um, I hope these are like, examples that help reinforce that concept. The third question uh, that you should ask yourself when you critique a visualization is, is the effectiveness principle followed? So this is the effectiveness principle was that use the best visual channel available for the most important aspect of your data. Um, and so essentially this means did the designer of the visualization choose the proper marks and channels? Like we, first we've only identified what they are, now we think about are these channels appropriate? Um, and you remember Stephen's psychophysical like power law, which is essentially the background of why we have a ranking of different channels. And so there's this relationship between physical intensity of a stimulus and the perceived sensation of it. And the only linear relationship between those two is length. And that's why position and length are such powerful visual variables compared to saturation or area or brightness. So here, for example, what is the channel? The size of the circles, yes. So I, I used the improved one, not the one that we had where the diameter was used for uh, encoding the data, but here this, these are actually the correct size of circles. So here this is the size, the circle size um, shows us um, the, the, the data that we care about. Is this the best visual variable available? No, so this is not the greatest chart. Um, so instead, we would, could have something like this, uh, where we use position in this line chart, um, and then like here, position is the most uh, is the, the strongest visual variable. Here, we're using them to encode the most important aspect of the data. Um, the fourth question is the uh, the fourth uh, thing that you should think about is the expressiveness principle. Is the expressiveness principle followed? Uh, the expressiveness the expressiveness principle says. The visualization should show all of the data and only the data. So no extraneous elements, no unjustified uh, whatever is in this graph. Um, there are cases uh, where you can actually violate the rule for, uh, for good reasons. Uh, so we talked about this chart chunk and the useful chunk and for memorability and so on. So this is like a, um, a little bit up to the designer. Uh, but what's going on here is this chart that we've seen all before. It doesn't really like there. There, you should never use chart chunk um, in a way that um, that interferes with the accuracy of the like our, of the accuracy of the chart. Uh, so when I cannot read something anymore, or when something is super distracting, then it's probably not a good choice. The five, the fifth point that you should think about is scales. Are the scales appropriate? So we've talked a lot about what does a, zero, a scale from zero mean. We said that a scale from, scale from zero is often a good default, but not necessarily always a good default. What we really prefer is showing data variation, um, showing the effect in the data, and not just showing zero scales. Um, so remember this uh, video that we looked at. And so here is an example where this is obviously not followed, right? This is this uh, Fox News. Um, a chart of Bush tax cards expire uh, before and after and here, so the graphical effect is not proportional to the effect in the data. So this is essentially what Tufty called um, has a high lie factor because we have a disproportionality of the size of the mark um, compared to the size of the effect. 
Again, remember, we don't want to always say all scales need to start at zero. We care about being faithful, being like essentially make good decisions. And you'll be asked to judge these kinds of things. The sixth important point is context. Is the data shown in the appropriate context? Am I like showing all of the relevant data or am I omitting something? Or am I like cherry picking my data? So we had this example here with global warming where essentially if you just plotted these couple of years since 1997, uh, from 1997 to 2011, it essentially looks like an almost like there's barely an upwards trend, but of course if you frame the data correctly, you see quite a different trend here. So picking the right framing, picking the right amount of data um, to show, bringing in the context is important. This is something that is a little bit hard to judge if you see uh, like a, a visualization without knowing more about the data, but very often you should at least be mindful of that. Uh, the seventh question you should ask yourself is, would derived data be better? So, like, for example, if, if, if we uh, have um, uh, like the book, the, the, um, uh, the change in, in uh, tax rates, we could instead, instead of showing the absolute tax rates, we could instead show the change in tax rate, right? So we can like, explicitly show a change instead of absolutely uh, absolute values. Or sometimes it might be better to show a, di show a distribution instead of all of the data points. So we didn't talk too much about distributions and so on, but the question that you should ask yourself is, um, do I need to see the data, all of the data that is there, especially if you have a very complex chart. Remember the fertility chart we had for Japan and the United States, um, where we had like, these, these complex animations, and if you think a little bit about this chart, there's actually a much better way to simply take a derived data set and show it in a simplified version. Here's a couple of other guidelines. Uh, no unjustified 3D. What are the problems with three-dimensional representations? Difficult to perceive. What's it? Difficult to perceive. Difficult to perceive, so depth judgments are hard. Then we have... Might not be necessary. Well, might not be necessary, yes. Uh, occlusion. Occlusion is a problem. Very often we need to do some perspective distortion to make it appear three-dimensional, which is then not faithful to the, uh, to the size of the item. Very often we need to do the lighting, which then causes shades, and the shades might distort any color that we, that we might be using. Uh, we have problems with navigation in 3D, and so on. Uh, the next guideline is that time progresses linearly. This is very obvious, but it should also be like that in the chart. So if you have five years, consecutive years, they should be in the order of how time flows and not in some different order, and they should be proportionally spaced between uh, acts, uh, uh, according to their time points that we observe. Um, you should be aware of all of these uh, perception issues, things about color, what are good color maps, what are, what are the effects of color, how does it interact uh, with each other. We had many of those examples in the perception lectures, for example, that. Uh, Light color is perceived darker when it is in the context of other very dark colors. You should be aware of color blindness, especially of red-green blindness, because this is, a, uh, this is something that um, affects a lot of people, um, uh, of shadows, of the effect of shadows, um, and all of these other things. Uh, you should think about uh, Gestalt principles, for example, or specifically thinking about using symmetry, symmetry and continuity. Um, you might consider thinking about pop-out effects. So what do you want to highlight? How can you leverage the pop-out or pre-attentive processing so that people immediately understand uh, what is going on in the chart? Uh, what are the, the important points to look at? Um, you sh like we're not gonna have on the, on the midterm, of course, it's not gonna be interactive or animated, but still you should judge the quality of the interaction and the animation. We've looked at some of the guidelines uh, last, last week. Um, and then one thing that I didn't really mention too much yet, but what is of course super critical is appropriate legend and labels. So everything that is shown in the chart should have um, the right legends, labels, and scales associated with it. Okay, great. So this brings me to uh, the design critique that I wanted to do. Um, and so I'll be handing this out in a second. This is a New York Times. Uh, figure, um, or it's actually an interactive one. So this was in 2014, 
in 2014 there were there were a lot of incidents with um, with recalls for cars, especially because of the Takama airbags, which caused like a many many recalls. And so this visualization shows us um, how many cars have been recalled. Um, okay, and so I'll let this play, and then I'll hand this out, and then you have five minutes to discuss this. And use kind of like the guidelines that I just um, explained, and then uh, we'll talk about it as a group.
What's the data we see here? The number, of recalls, the number of cars being recalled. The number of cars that are being recalled um, in, like, in what, in what time frame? 2014. Okay, so what we're looking at right here is just like uh, the proportion essentially of cars that are being recalled, right? Um, Wasn't there a bar chart before though that shows every year? That was a just yes. So here was a, a distribution that essentially showed us the number of recalls, um, how, like in absolute numbers, um, that um, how many recalls have there been in these different years. And so this is actually, I would even argue that this is a pretty good visualization here uh, compared to this one probably, right? Um, so um, what are the marks? You could say shapes or points or cars. Um, all of that is correct. What is the, the channel is a little trickier here. I the speed, the speed, the proportion of some color cars. Correct. It is the proportion, uh, and which is kind of like the relative count, which is kind of a tricky channel, right? It's not color. Color is, is kind of a channel to show us the to show us the difference between the cars that have been recalled versus those that have not been recalled. But what we really care about is here is the, the count. Um, and of course, this is not an absolute count. This is only like a proportion. Each, each car here stands for um, an individual item. Uh, not for an individual item, but for a group of cars, of course. Um, so then, uh, the, uh, is the effectiveness principle followed? Are the visual channels here appropriate? No, no. Yeah. So we can't really judge whether this is 55% of the cars that have been recalled here or is 70%. We kind of have an impression, right, that it's roughly half, but we don't know exactly. Um, so um, it's, this is not like what did this, uh, especially like position if you, yeah, or these like these counts or these, these proportions, if you like group them together and utilize positioners or size, then it would be appropriate, but here we're essentially just giving this like cloud of things to people, which is of course not an obvious, not a great um, encoding. Um, is the expressiveness principle followed? Is it does is only the data show and nothing but the data? No. no. So what are the distractive elements in here? Yeah. We have animations. Uh, the, speed the speed of the cars, which is actually many of you, like you heard, saw the speed encode something. It does not. <laughs> okay. 
So there's no meaning of the speed. This is, uh, this is distractioning. So we, we're using um, extraneous elements that make it harder for us to read the chart. And do you think that these violations are justified? Is this useful chunk? It's kind of cool, but it's not really communicate. Like the, I would, I would argue, well, it's fun to play around with it, but this chart tells more of a story, right? Um, so then uh, the scales. Well, we don't have scales, right? We the only the only thing is, well, this is one rare case where we don't really, well. So the proportions we get the proportions like weekly, but we don't get absolute numbers. So they should at least show us that one uh, uh, that each car here um, represents this and that many, but they don't. And by the way, I just read that one vehicle was recalled of every five. My judgment was it's roughly half, which is, just shows you how bad that uh, visual encoding works. And I guess another factor why this is so bad is because what is happening here in terms of perception? Like we have red in front of a sea of gray. Yeah. We have pop out yeah, effect. Yeah, pop out right? makes it so you. Yes. And so these red ones are super salient. The gray ones basically are, are hardly perceived. So um, this is like another problem here. What are the gray ones for? The gray ones they they represent all every card that is not uh, being recalled. Uh, context is the data shown in the appropriate context. So this chart doesn't really, right? This here gives us context. It, it gives us context of, of how exceptional that is compared to other previous years. But the animation itself doesn't do that. Then if we look at, would derived data be better? Um, well, show change instead of absolute values. Yes, we could show here a chart of change in this, like in this, in this chart here, it's probably a lost cause, but here we could show the change. But I guess in this case, I would probably argue that the absolute values are better uh, because we care more about the absolute values. Yes? But wouldn't chart values in this case actually be proportion? Because what we see is not really proportion. We see cars which represent the amount. Yes. So we actually see a representation of the amount of proportion, so it wouldn't be proportion, right? Um, yes, and yes to some degree, it is, it is like, the, the, it's, it's kind of derived by simply multiplying with a static factor. So yes, in that way it is derived, but I would think of this as not like really derived in, in terms of calculating anything. It's just like a representation of the, of the encoding, like one car represents 10, uh, or one car symbol represents 100 cars or something like that. So I, don't, I wouldn't... So what I'm saying, if you Bar chart, you yeah. say like, I don't know, 30, well, pie chart, 30%, yeah. that would be derived data, right? Yes, that would be derived data. Uh, yeah, yes, to some degree. Like, but like, what, I, what I'm thinking of when I talk about derived data isn't, isn't these super simple derivations of like part of a whole, uh, but it is more of like, can we transform it in change? Can we make some kind of higher level aggregation? But yeah, it's, it's definitely a valid argument what you're making. And then um, other guidelines. We don't have um, unjustified 3D um, time here progresses linearly in this chart. Um, in this chart here, um, I would say that this doesn't like really apply because we only see one time point. Um, the perception of these, we talked about the issues with pop out um, and how that make, leads us to overestimate uh, um, the number of cars that are being recalled. Um, it does. Um, use kind of like a, a gestalt principle or of, of good continuation, right? We assume that those cars keep driving, but it's meaningless uh, in some way. Um, it, the use of interaction or animation, do you think this is appropriate? No, no. It's, it's a distraction, right? Um, it doesn't, like, especially that these cars move about um, and that they have different speeds, um, that they're simply, like, not super um, interesting um, animation here. Uh, and um, legends and labels, I guess uh, these are largely okay here. Um, so if we look at, at like one of these um, further charts, so what is going on here? Um, K 
can you like understand what is happening? Um, what are these different values? Yeah? yeah. What are so like position is showing the make of the car that it's describing? Uh, yes. Um, and and so we have the three different conditions. Like, what is the first condition? All of them. And then we have the Honda and nine other airbags. So is this included in the other one here or not? Yes. I think so, but do we know? <laughs> it, it seems like to me, like this is not four times as much up here than this is down here, right? Do you know? Like, I have a hard time judging that. Um, so maybe yes, maybe no. These cars seem to be a, a little bit faster, but I don't know. <laughs> um, so what else do we have? Oops. Oh, and then here I think we had one example with time. Yeah. So this this one is kind of confusing, right? So again, we have all of the recalls here on top, and then we have five years or older and ten years or older. So like again, this isn't clear whether these are proportions. Again, I'm not sure whether those include each other. So this is a little bit fishy. And so why do you think these designers have used like what? The, why are they doing what they're doing here? They want to leave this graphs little ambiguous so that people. <laughs> <laughs> That's a devious interpretation. <laughs> my favorite, my, yeah. Well, they just want to make it look cool because you would share these and you would not share uh, Yeah, exactly. So they wanted to make it look cool. Maybe some of them have just recently played with a new library for force directed graph or force animations or something like that. Um, so this is not a good, not a well designed chart. Um, Okay, so any more questions about this? They don't really tell you if it's whether they're manufactured that year or if that's the year that the recall happened, so. Yeah, this is, uh, yeah. Any other comments? Uh, can you please explain again the difference between what you mean by derived data and absolute value? So, um, for example, um, what we have very often, if we have, like, for example, um, um, if the, let's say, unemployment rate, right? Uh, we, we have an unemployment rate, or we have an employment rate of 96% um, uh, or compared to 95% um, for a year earlier, or 93% two years earlier. Um, if you just show this uh, at, at a scale from zero, you might barely notice the effect, right? And instead of, of, of showing the, the absolute value of the employment rate, you could just show the, the percent change in unemployment rate. So you can see that from three years ago to uh, two years ago, there was a 1% decrease in unemployment rate and could encode that. And from last year to this year, there was a 5% uh, decrease in unemployment. So if you want to visualize change, um, then it might make sense to explicitly encode the change, for example, instead of just showing the absolute data. So, like doing some simple math and uh, encoding the change. Or, if you have a ton of data items, you might show a distribution in a histogram. Um, or you might show the median uh, of a data set uh, plus its standard deviation instead of all of the data points. This is what I mean with like doing some kind of like math on top of of your um, raw data to efficiently communicate what you actually want to do without having do too many distracting data items on the screen. Is that clear? Okay. Great. So then we'll move on to talking about views. I have a suspicion that this will. Okay. Um, so we have, we talked a little bit about multiple views uh, before. Remember this um, when we had this. Uh, what I already mentioned today, the fertility rate in Japan and the United States. Uh, we had first an animation, and then we, then we had multiple views. Um, now we'll talk a little bit more formalized about what it means to have multiple views. Um, like one point about multiple views is this principle of eyes over memory. We have a trade-off between display space and working memory. Right? We can show 
things um, in a, like at time point one and then transition to a time point two, or we could show both time points at the same time, maybe in different views. Um, and so there's a couple of different approaches to um, uh, using multiple views. Um, this is here juxtaposition and coordination of multiple side-by-side -side views. Uh, we could have um, uh, same or different encodings, um, or uh, we could then subset, we could have shared data. Do we have, is all of the data shared between different, subs, uh, between different views? Is a subset of the data shared between different views, or are none of the data items shared between different views? Um, we can uh, think about the navigation in here, um, and then we will talk about partitioning. Uh, for example, if we have uh, two different conditions, we can partition these into separate views. Um, or we can superimpose them. So in this case here, we're superimposing those two into one chart. Um, but yeah, we'll go over this in detail now. So what are linked views? Um, multiple linked views. Um, uh, linked views are multiple views that are simultaneously visible and linked together such that actions in one view affect the other. So can anybody give me an example for that? So, what's that? Homework five. <laughs> Can you be like specific what in homework five? <laughs> well, if you show the map and then you choose a year and then you see like the uh, period and so forth. Yes. Yeah, and on the tree map, when you hover over a country, it shows you the path. Yes, exactly. That is linked views. So I select something in one view and see my selection in the other view, usually in a different context. Um, what would be another uh, linked view example? If I have an overview plus detail map, for example, where I have like a, a mini world map, or you probably know this from like um, uh, various strategy games where you have like a map of the environment and then you have a little rectangle in, in, in there that shows where your out of view is currently at. And so you could move around the rectangle and then move around your out of view. This would be another example of a linked view. Um, when you, you have a couple of options when we talk about uh, linked views. It could, there is the option of the encoding. Is it the same coding or is it a different encoding? Hence, multiform visualization. Uh, is the data set shared? Um, is, is all of it shared? Is a subset shared or is none of it shared? So, for example, what does it mean? If we share all, um, like if we plot the, a map on one side uh, and with data points on top of it, and then on the other side you plot a table with the GPS coordinates plus all of the data points, we share all of the data. We just show it in different ways. Um, if we have this navigation example where I have an overview map and then a small example or a small window where I show details, then I show a part of the data. Uh, if there's no data shared, maybe just the items, then I have none of the data set shared between them. Um, and then these uh, major options that I just mentioned is highlighting and navigation, to link or not, to share or not. So here is a simple example from in MATLAB of shared highlighting. We have two scatter plots uh, and a map, and I can highlight something um, in the map, and it is also highlighted in the scatter plot. So this is like a very basic example. And interestingly, does Excel support something like this? Yes? Okay, I didn't know that, but it must be recently. Um, Tableau does, but also not for a very long time. So many, many different visualization uh, tools or like ggplot and so on, uh, they don't explicitly support this interactively. Very often you can use a data encoding um, to kind of get something like this, but not interactively. So here's a pretty sophisticated example of linked highlighting. This is Keshev, which is an academic project. This was a PhD student from the uh, University of Maryland, and he is now, like he's graduated and has uh, founded a startup to like cell cache here. Um, and so this is a data, like he has a ton of data sets. This is a data set about um, a various uh, fast growing private companies in America. And you see here's different facets of this data set. We have IT services, um, advertising and marketing and so on. And whenever I hover over any of those items, we can see that all of these other views have shared linking, right? And so if I hover here over this bar, we can see that these two companies here, Provider Power and Superfish, are in that subset. Um, and I can see the distribution of um, 
this, um, this growth segment here in all of these other data sets. And I can also actually log that in, and now I'm only operating on those data sets, and I can do additional highlights on top of this. Um, Multiform is a way of using different visual encodings um, between different views. Um, this, to some degree, implies shared data, um, either all of the data or some of the data, um, for overview and detail. And the rationale here is that a single monolithic view has strong limits on the number of attributes that can be shown simultaneously, or that the different views have different strengths and weaknesses. So for example, um, the example I gave earlier with the map showing something in the geospatial context versus showing something, for example, in the table or in a scatter plot. Um, this is going to be homework six. Um, and this is an example of uh, where we use multiform to encode the same data. So uh, homework six, we will be visualizing the Obama and Romney um, presidential election. Um, and so we have two times we encode the same thing. How did the various states vote? Um, and um, so this is like up on top here in this stack bar chart and then here on the map. So we use two different views um, to show something different. So here we show mainly the proportion of like who was the overall winner because we also have the threshold that you need to win. Um, and down here we show the geographic context, the geospatial context. Where are the states that voted for um, these various candidates? Um, when we talk about shared data, we um, mean that we show all the data in each view but with different encoding schemes. And this is what we just had earlier. Well, we didn't have the geospatial information here. So this shared most of the data but not all of the data. And the rationale here would be different views support different tasks. Um, so here's an example uh, which is like a pretty complex uh, view actually. Um, here we use two different encodings for a network, for a graph. On the one side we use a matrix and on the other side we use a node link diagram. Maybe this one here is a better example uh, because it's easier, it's more accessible. So here we show the same data. We show a network. Um, here on the right and then on the left we show a list of all paths like we showed it all the list, a list of the path we connect this node to this node. And so here we show it as a list, and there we show it as a node link diagram. And the node link diagram has the benefits of giving us a sense of like what are the important nodes, right? We can see that this person here is very central to um, this network because he, has, he makes many of these connections. Uh, this diagram has the benefit that we can actually um, rank those paths, we have the lists, and we can, uh, we can also show additional information about these nodes in uh, juxtaposed here. So we share all of the network data, but in this case we actually don't share the attribute data. We could also show the attribute data in here, but then the network might be harder to read. Um, so this principle overview in detail is one of the uh, key things in, when we use multiple, uh, multiple link views. Uh, we show one view, which shows often a summary of the information about the entire data set, while additional views show more detailed information about a subset of the data, which is essentially user-driven. This fo follows this principle that we talked about by Schneiderman, overview first, zoom and filter details on demand. Um, and the rationale here is that for large or for complex data set, a single view of the entire data set can usually not capture fine details. So if you think about your homework, where did you do something like this detail on demand? The, the, the last one, number four. What's it? Where you basically select the World Cup and then it shows you the details. Yes. The overview and the... Exactly. You select one World Cup and it, it shows the details, or you could even say the tooltip shows the details on demand, or if you implemented the extra credit uh, and then um, if you click the country, select the country and it shows you all the World Cups that it participated in, there will be also details on the amount. Um, here is an example um, that does that well.
Last time it worked, this time it doesn't work. Oh well, uh, I think I can essentially speak for him. So you have here a stock, uh, you have here a stock data set, and then the user selects a subset of this uh, data set, and then these subsets are uh, shown in the view below it, right? And now the green one shows this segment here, the black one shows this segment here. And we can see more details about those segments. So here we use the same visual encoding, um, but just like a different scale for these different views. Now he's zooming in on Black Monday, which was like a stock market crash in the 80s. Okay. is a multi-scale Sentinel browser for comparative genomics data. It is the first... So this is again um, uh, multiple coordinated views, but here it's not exactly the same information, but it shows you relationship, like this is kind of, well, I'll let her explain, but um, this is like one uh, chromosome that we see here, and then we see the same chromosome here in much more detail. Sentinel browser with side-by-side -side dim views of the data across a range of scales. The genome view showing all of its chromosomes, the chromosome view showing all of its blocks, and the block view showing all of the conserved genomic features within it. MISB incorporates a variety of visual cues and interaction mechanisms that allow biologists to understand four different relationship types, proximity, size, orientation, and similarity. The high-level genome view shows a circular overview of all source chromosomes on the outer ring with the destination chromosomes on the inner ring. Selecting a source chromosome highlights it in black, and a copy of it also appears inside. We encode this antennic relationship using connection with these foreign curves linking the matched blocks colored by the destination chromosome using a repeating eight-element color map. The colors also provide an overview of all block destinations. So I guess you get the idea. Here we have an overview of the connections, and then here we see a detail about the selected chromosome, and then here we see the relationship between the selected chromosome and, and another chromosome, the most frequently, like the most frequent target in that case. Um, this is another example. Um, here uh, we have essentially details only like in the one case, or in actually in both cases, it's mostly geometric in increase of the zoom level. So here we have four different clusters, um, one, two, three, four, and then we want to look at one cluster in more detail, and we have enlarged it. So this is a copy of that same cluster. On the right here we have uh, different networks and juxtapose data on top of these networks. So what we care about here is these, uh, like the color coding on the nodes that essentially tells experts uh, what is going on for these particular patients and these particular biological processes. Um, and so you get an overview here using small multiples uh, of these different conditions. So you can see that here most of the things are blue, uh, whereas here they're red. And if you want to see exactly what is going on, we can, we can create like a, a detailed view where we can read individual labels and where we can make judgments of whether this is an important effect or not. Um, I just mentioned small multiples and we've used them before, but formally, like small multiples here, each view uses the same visual encoding but shows a different subset of the data. And the rationale is to quickly be able to compare different parts of the data set relying in eye, in, on eyes instead of memories. And so here's an example um, of, um, again, a biological network um, juxtaposed or like augmented with experimental data on top of it. Um, and what we see here is we see the same network seven times, uh, like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, uh, but with six different experimental conditions mapped on it, which kind of drive the color coding. So we can see that here is, for example, or is it a good example? So here, up here, there is no green or red nodes, but if we look at the same area down here, we can see that there is a couple of, of green nodes. And so this is a video for that. 
The biologist views experimental data by selecting node attributes corresponding to measurements collected for each node in the graph. Each experimental condition is mapped to a small multiple view and an axis in the parallel coordinates view. The values associated with a node map to an intersection point on the axis and a color coding in the more small multiples view. The size and number of columns in the small multiples view is adjustable. So can anyone uh, tell me any obvious problems with that? What happens if I have a hundred different experiments that I want to visualize? It's tiny. Yes. Exactly. Whenever I use these uh, small multiples, they're going to be small, right? And they're going to be increasingly small the more items I have. So, that, and I guess the other thing is you probably all know these um, like riddles essentially where in newspapers where you have two almost identical pictures and you have to find the differences. Um, that's, 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 that's interesting because it's hard, right? So spotting those differences can be quite hard. Um, of course, if you use proper pop-out, like as they do here, like we have the right colors to highlight it and so on, this task is a lot easier. Um, here, just to recap that, we are using the same principle um, for small multiples. So here we have the detail view, but the small multiples are shown here in small with these different encodings on top of them. Okay, so now we'll talk about partitioning. Uh, partitioning is an action on a data set that separates the data into group. Um, the, the design choices that you have is how to divide the data up between views, given, for example, a hierarchy of attributes, how many splits you want to make, the order of the splits, how many views you have, which is usually data-driven, so like you, I make one split per category, for example. Um, and then uh, the partitioning attributes are usually categorical, but I can also threshold, right? I, if I have, let's say, cars before 1985 and cars after 1985, then I would have a threshold and numerical value. Um, so here is, um, pr uh, I think these are, this is pension data, um, partitioned by state in this case, or uh, uh, this is actually population data, um, 65 years or over, 45 to 64 years and so on, um, partitioned by state. Um, so we see here's all of California, here's New York, Florida, uh, Illinois, Pennsylvania, and so on. And then if we partition it by age group and state, it's like here are the 65 and overs, here are the 45 to 64, the 25 to 44, and here are the states. So we have partitioned in, in both categories in states and in these age groups in this case. Which is the better visualization here? This one? Yeah. You sure? I mean, I like that. <laughs> I, I would say there's not really one better, right? It depends on what the questions you want to ask. Um, the, I guess you could say that you can see that you have more space to show the data here. And, and I would even argue that, the, that these um, effects of the biggest groups are these like 25 to 44 year olds. That is very salient here. It might not be quite as salient here, right? Um, so uh, it, it always depends on what you want to ask, but if you want to make comparisons within an age group across states, for example, to spot, to spot like, that Florida is a, like, a favorite spot for pensioners, um, this might be the better visualization because you can spot that Florida here is higher uh, compared to uh, other um, age groups. You can also partition by category, Once, if you've ever ha had a machine learning class, You've seen this data set, this is this iris data set uh, where we have pedal length and uh, pedal width uh, across two different, uh, or in this case only pedal length and pedal width and not sepal length and sepal width, which is also in the data set uh, in, in three different plant species. And so we could plot this all in one plot, but we can also partition it out. Why would I want to partition this out like that? Does it make any sense for this data set? Not too much, right? I could easily show the same information uh, in all of the uh, in, in just one plot. But imagine I have overlapping classes and lots of points. Uh, then I, the partitioning it out might make a lot of sense, and I might be able to reduce my clutter. 
Um, uh, an example of a, a visualization technique that takes this partitioning to the extreme is the trellis plot. Um, so the data, like in the trellis plot, we have panel variables, partitioning variables, and it does also things like main effects ordering. Um, so the panel variables are the attributes encoded in the individual views. Like what we see here is the barley yield in 9031 and 9032 um, in different areas. Um, and then within those areas, four different types of grain. Uh, so we have these three different, um, these three different essentially uh, facets to the data. Um, we are partitioning the attributes. Um, the partitioning attributes are assigned to columns. So this would be the years in this case. And then we have a main effect ordering. Um, so here, the main effect ordering is the yield. Um, I think at least. Um, so there is some kind of like somebody has calculated the median and this has, a co uh, has ordered it accordingly. Um, so columns partitioned by year, rows partitioned by farm. Um, a different um, approach would be to uh, not partition it out but to use color. And does this chart look familiar to anybody? Anybody looked at Homer 5? This is what we have in homework five, right? Um, so we have, um, like here we see 9032 versus 9031. We see that the, like in most places, or in this, on this farm, 9031 was the better year. Um, in this, on, like the same in this one here, 9032 was the better year. Um, and so we are using kind of the same thing. Um, here we show like the goals conceded versus the goals won. We use an additional encoding um, for like the color, did they have a positive difference in goals or a negative difference in goals, uh, in goals by using this line here. So this is blue versus red uh, and if you won versus lost. Um, and then you can also do recursive subdivision. Um, the partition here is flexibly uh, to flexibly transform data attributes into a hierarchy. Um, and uh, we could use, for example, tree maps as space filling rectangular layouts. So we've seen this, these tree maps in the lecture on layouts last Tuesday. Um, and so here, uh, this is partitioned first by the map of the market is partitioned, like this is a stock market uh, by sector. Um, and so we see healthcare, financials, oil and gas, and so on. And then, um, well, then we see individual items, but we could envision this nesting this deeper too. Uh, Here is a, a pretty intricate example, um, and I'll show you a video about this. This is um, London property values, um, and we have partitioning attributes, the type of the house, the neighborhood, the sale time, and then on top of that we have encoding attributes, the average price and color, and the number of sale and size. Um, and then uh, we can see uh, between the different neighborhoods, we have different housing distributions, and within the neighborhoods, we see that we have similar prices. So, you see that most of these neighborhoods um, are pretty constant with, with respect to their color. Um, and uh, we can't really compare how, how the, for the same neighborhood, how a flat compares to a terraced house, for example. That's not possible. I would have to do a different partition for that. Um, and this tool actually can do these partitionings extremely flexibly. So here we have partitioning attributes neighborhood location, the neighborhood, the house type, the sale time, a year, the sale time of the month. Um, and the encoding attribute, again, average price, the size isn't used, it's just like the squares. Um, and so here we can see that expensive neighborhoods are near the, uh, near the center of the city. And so this is a good video that illustrates this. If it plays. This video accompanies the Interlist 2000. This video accompanies the Interlist 2009 paper of the same name. It demonstrates how hierarchical layouts can be used to explore multivariate data through the reconfiguration using London property transactions as an example. We run through all the figures in the paper using the notation we developed to describe their states, the operators we use to reconfigure their states, and show how this can help us address the questions. Property transactions in this view are conditioned using property type and the year of sale. Rectangles are sized by the number of sales and colored by the average price. Almost half of all sales are flat. 
Since the rectangles are ordered by size, temporal trends are difficult to detect. We will now reconfigure the layouts to arrange the years per multiple. This view more clearly shows the upward trend in average price. To increase the temporal granularity, we will add month to the hierarchy. We also recolor to reflect the number of sales. Recall these calendar views. Years are arranged from left to right and months from top to bottom for each year. Purple is used to show the number of sales, which appear to vary seasonally. We expect there to be spatial variation in these data, so we will now insert London Borough into the basic hierarchy and use orange to show average price again. There are marked differences in sales, shown through size, and price, shown through colour, between boroughs, but it is difficult to see how to vary spatially as all the rectangles are ordered by size in the top left. We can see, however, that Wandsworth in the top left has the most sales and the City of London has the least. The size order doesn't let us identify spatial patterns very easily, so we now rearrange the rectangles spatially and temporally. We can now detect some spatial patterns. For example, we can see that the highest average prices tend to be central and west of the centre, and sales of flats dominate centrally, but less so peripherally. The rectangles are small where there are low sales, making it difficult to see the detail. In the next view, we fix the size of rectangles to show each with equal prominence. The detail of property types can now be resolved more easily, even where sales are low. To study how much each borough differs from the average ratio of property type sales, we will hypothesize that all boroughs will have the average ratio of sales, establish this as a baseline, and then color by the deviation of sales from this using a signed characteristic. This so this is what I mean by deriving what they're doing here and now. They calculate the average price and then instead of showing the price, they show the deviation from the average price. It can be used to test hypotheses. The diverging color scheme shows blue for lower than the baseline and red for higher than the baseline, showing that flat sales dominate in the center, but terrace and detached housing dominate in more peripheral areas. We will now remove property type from the hierarchy. Okay, you can you get the idea. What I really like about this tool, other than that it shows how flexibly you can slice and partition and dice a data set, uh, is also uh, they, they, they developed this very concise grammar of doing that. If you like, looked at the video, you saw that there were always like, these expressions down there. And I saw the conference talk by the student who did this, and he actually did all of these commands live. So he live coded in front of an audience of 500 people uh, to show how, what his tool is able to do. And I think that was very confident. <laughs> he did a good job. Um, Layering is essentially when I try to combine multiple views on top of one another to form a composite view. And the rationale here is that we, uh, we can get more detailed views than, um, or larger and more detailed views than when we use multiple views, but it imposes constraints on what we can do. We ideally have to have a, the same scale, um, and we will get visual clutter. So here is like simple example is layering um, multiple lines on a line chart, right? I don't need a one separate chart for every single line. Uh, but of course there is uh, limitations, right? This works well for a couple of lines, but then if I overdo it with the number of lines, suddenly it gets pretty cluttered. Um, here is a combined approach where we have partitioned and layered graphs. So here, uh, this is uh, gene expression data over time uh, across different species, across different, uh, I forgot what that was exactly. But anyways, it's faceted in two ways. Um, and what we see is here, it's, it's split up. So we can see each individually, but down here we have layer charts. Um, so we have both, in this case, partitioned and a layered graph. And so this is the last example. This is essentially taking multiple coordinate views to the max. Um, this is a, a, a video from like my own research where we try to let people build as many um, like as flexible visualizations that show relationships between pretty complex data sets. Domino is an interactive visualization technique for extracting, comparing, and manipulating subsets across multiple tabular data sets. This video demonstrates Domino using a music charts data set. You can download the demo version and the data set at domino.calado.org. This is the main Domino interface. It consists of a Domino board, and the block browser. The block browser shows a list of all loaded data subsets. Domino distinguishes between three block types. Partition blocks 
show categorical data like gender. Numerical blocks show numerical data, such as the release year of the first album. And matrix blocks show item combinations, like the count of number one hits for each artist in different countries. Relationships are represented in different granularities and directions using lines and bands. Placeholders and live previews help to add new blocks. When dragging an element from the block browser onto the board, possible drop positions are indicated. When entering a placeholder, a live preview of the data is shown. By dropping the item, the selection is confirmed. Domino allows users to quickly create advanced setups. Blocks can be added. Visualization types can be switched. Blocks can be transposed. Sorted and enhanced with labels. Okay, so you can see that this was a fun project to work on. For artists, but also for countries at the same time. I guess our main challenge here was that the user interface was pretty tricky. Um, you needed to. This is like as complex as maybe Adobe Illustrator. So it's not. It's not for the absolute novice to use, but at least you don't need to know programming um, to use a tool like that. Okay, so I have seven minutes left. I have this other exercise, but I think we're just going to call it a day because it's going to take way long. Um, I'll see you guys in three weeks. Have a do well in your midterm and have a good fall break.